uh, our getting into that aspect, that level. So I would not like to stand between Professor Erandi and the audience, which is studied by these wonderful speakers who are going to follow me. But I was intrigued by the fact that this being the decade of action that the UNEP and all of us had agreed to and signed into has been for restoration through reimagination, recreation and restoration. Uh, that there are so many hours, uh, Erandi, uh, in addition to your three hours of reduce, reuse and recycle. Uh, I was intrigued when I was reading around that there is regeneration, recreation, reversal, refinement, relationships, reconnect, recommend, and lots of ours in the English language. And I'm sure in whatever our language in the vernacular, we can bring about so much of value and meaning in our joint effort towards achieving that goal. I know what you have done in terms of plastics and polythene, in terms of uh, 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 solid waste management within our university community, as well as reaching out. And I, I treat every one of these 100 plus students of ours who have joined this afternoon to be each an important ambassador and a change agent for the better in our part of the country, as well as the rest of the world. So uh, I would not like to take any more of your time but thank each and every one of you for joining in as one community to make the world a better place, which I'm sure we can collectively. All the very best and have an enjoyable evening. Uh, despite all the negative uh, happenings in the recent past, I'm sure we can, as a group, uh, join up with government, civil society, and uh, all the important stakeholders and help make Sri Lanka the true uh, biodiverse uh, uh, country that can be the leader in the world. Thank you and all the very best. Aibuan. Thank you very much, Madam. Now I would like to invite Professor Irandati Lokopitya to introduce our first guest speaker, Professor Sinil Vijay Sundara, who will be speaking on the restoration of some important ecosystems in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Sandani. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our first invited speaker, Professor Sril Vijay Sundara. He obtained his BSc special degree and MPhil in botany from the University of Peradeniya, and his PhD is in biology from the City University of New York. He has won seven presidential awards for his research work so far, and he was the former Director General of the Department of National Botanical Gardens. Also, he was an honorary professor at the Department of Ecology and Biodiversity at the University of Hong Kong from 2001 to 2010. He currently uh, is currently working as a research professor on plant taxonomy and conservation at the National Institute of Fundamental Studies of Sri Lanka. And uh, Professor Vijay Sundara, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Andini, and thank you, uh, Professor Lokubitya, for inviting me to this very important uh, occasion. And I hope I'm given the screen, screen share facility. Okay. Um, right. Um, so my topic is uh, restoring some important ecosystems in Sri Lanka. But before that, we should know what are the major ecosystems in Sri Lanka. So I'd like to uh, bring your attention to the list of major ecosystems that appeared in uh, the NBSAP uh, report. NBSAP stands for National Biodiversity Strategic Action Plan for 2016 to 2022. And there you can see, I think that's a very comprehensive list of ecosystems. Uh, major ecosystems. Uh, now, if you take uh, the ones that you see in the screen, uh, the forest ecosystems are given here: lowland wet evergreen forest, mid evergreen, uh, mid, mid elevation evergreen forest, mountain evergreen forest. Uh, 
uh, moist mix evergreen forest, dry mix evergreen forest, and arid mix evergreen forest. And of course, there are edific variants as well as anthropogenic variants. Now, rock outcrops, swamp forest, and sand dunes, and palmyra woodlands, all these are edific variants. Depending on where you are, depending on the substrate, there are different variants. Those are brought about by edific factors. And then again, there are anthropogenic variants of those forest types, like secondary forest, uh, forest plantations, and so on. Similarly, there are uh, grasslands, uh, different types of grasslands, edific variants of those, and also some uh, anthropogenic variants of those grasslands. Then, of course, we have caves, and there are some uh, totally anthropogenic or totally man made ecosystems like home gardens, public parks, agro plantations, and so on. Uh, also, we have uh, aquatic and marine ecosystems with their uh, edific and anthropogenic variants. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we should, we, I mean, we have seen, uh, Dr. Professor Lokupiti also mentioned, due to various reasons, uh, many of our ecosystems are disturbed. She has given uh, so many different ways. Um, uh, by which the ecosystems are destroyed and disturbed. And then it is also important that those ecosystems are restored. And she has also mentioned why we should restore our ecosystems and what are the, the roles, or what are the functions of those ecosystems and why we should restore them. Now, before restoration, we should know what was the original ecosystem and what factors caused the destruction or disturbance. Now, if you are left with, a, with an area with few scattered trees, we should know what was there before, or the, whether it was a forest or whether it was a grass and or what. And then also you should know what, was the, what, were, what are the factors that were vital or that were important for maintaining the original ecosystem. Now, this, those original ecosystems may have got disturbed, maybe because of our actions, or maybe some of those factors that were important for maintaining the status of that ecosystem would have got disturbed or something happened. So we have to first understand uh, what was the original system and why, how it was maintained. And then, uh, now if you take the forest ecosystems, now imagine you are left with the, uh, you, are, you, are, you have to restore the ecosystem like this, uh, as, uh, uh, an area with a few scattered trees and bare land. And you should know what was there before. Just imagine that, uh, I mean, you presume that uh, the original ecosystem was like this. And now you are uh, left with this because of some activities. And your plan is to restore and bring back a forest. And maybe with a bit of luck, you will end up in uh, uh, creating a forest like this. But as you can see, it's not exactly like the one which was there before. But then you are getting a bit closer you will never be able to restore the same ecosystem. It's not possible, but then at least you can come close. But then again, you can also uh, have, can have, have a situation like this. You have this ecosystem and you do some activity to uh, restore it and you will come, you will end up with this, which is, which has nothing, to, I mean, which is not similar to the original ecosystem. So you have to be careful uh, what we should do to bring back the original ecosystem. So that's why you always say you should know what was there before and your, your activities should uh, uh, be there to bring back or come closer to the original ecosystem. But then uh, there are various methods. I'm just listing only three methods. There are other methods as well. These are some major, uh, you know, main, active, main methods. Uh, first is enrichment planting or just planting, forest planting. And the second one is, second one is framework species method by which you can restore a forest and also assisted natural regeneration. Now, enrichment plant is very sim simple. I mean, that's exactly what you do every day. I mean, there are so many different types of forest uh, planting and you organize the planting ceremony and you go to a nursery and you know bring whatever is available and then you organize the shamadhan or whatever function and bring important people or blah, blah, and then you organize the pre-planting ceremony. So that's what's happening uh, everywhere. And um, I mean, practically every year we will be having, we are seeing various planting techniques, I mean, planting uh, ceremonies. Now, there, the, the thing is that it's you who decide what to be planted. So you select what is available or what do you think is the best 
and then you plant. And then uh, you are, now if you plant, uh, let's say 10 acres uh, and maybe let's say 1000 trees. And uh, so you are, uh, that area, that 10 acres have a diversity of 1000 trees. And that diversity is designed by you, uh, determined by you. And uh, it's limited. Uh, so, and also uh, most of these planting ceremonies are uh, determined or uh, it's limited to the, the availability of plants. So that's why you see everywhere uh, people are planting either kumbu trees or me trees because that's, those are the kind of trees which are generally available in the nursery. And then uh, one other thing I want to mention here in relation to that, uh, I told you that well, you have to know what is the original ecosystem, what was the original ecosystem. And then here, this was the photograph I took from Silon News uh, of a planting ceremony that happened in uh, uh, Alla area back in 2019. And as you can see, these people are planting trees very enthusiastically uh, in a grassland. So this was actually, you know, when it, when it, I mean, since it's Alla, it should be dry patana grassland. And it's a different, uh, that's a unique ecosystem of its own right. So what we are doing here is just trying to convert one ecosystem to another. I mean, you are having good intentions, but you should be having not known what was there before and what was the ecosystem you are trying to uh, convert. You are doing a great damage to the ecology. So those, those things have to be done. And then even if you do a simple thing like planting trees, you have to know where you are planting and what you are planting. And uh, this is something I have done. Um, but uh, about eight years ago, uh, so done for a different purpose. That's why you see you don't see any undergrowth. But it's possible. You can now all these trees were planted, and uh, within uh, ten uh, years or so maybe eight years, you can come up with a very good uh, high vegetation if you uh, attend to those trees that you plant. I mean, just planting and going out is not uh, the thing. You should attend to the trees that you have planted. Then uh, I'll come to the next method. Now that is framework species method. They are you try to select some plants, some pioneer plants or mixed successional species and plant them. This is actually to attract dispersal agents, like, I mean, those trees are having large fruits or something, so that uh, birds or other animals who will come and perch uh, on those trees and then uh, they also bring property use from nearby habitat. So with time, uh, there will be more species and uh, some native species and native seeds will come uh, those are brought by those uh, animals maybe birds or bats or whoever the animals that will bring uh, those seeds will enrich the area and then diversity will be increased i'll give an example uh, i mean this is a model actually by uh, some people who worked in uh, thailand this is actually very uh, heavily uh, practiced in thailand and also in some parts of malaysia uh, the, the group led by um, um, uh, a scientist called Elliot, uh, he, he developed this uh, model. There, what to do is you just select the framework species uh, and the plant about 20 to 30 uh, species and uh, weed and fertilize. And then, with time, uh, the weeds will go away because there will be increased shade and the, the forest structure will be recovered. And then, uh, uh, litter accumulation, nutrient cycling, forest dynamics will happen. And then, uh, the wildlife will be attracted. And, There'll be recruitment of uh, recruitment, and you know, naturally occurring plants will come, and then finally biodiversity will be recovered, and you will come up. You will end up with the target forest, uh, the, the restored target forest. So all these activities will happen, and then uh, you will get a good forest. And this is an example. Uh, uh, this is actually again from Thailand, and uh, this was a barren land in 1998, and. In, uh, in about 15 years, they were able to convert this into a forest. And uh, these arrows show two bends, and the same bends are here. And this tree is the same tree here. Uh, as you can see, uh, this barren land was converted into a lush vegetation. And the method they used was uh, a framework species method. And the other method is assisted natural regeneration. It's also a very simple method. They are what you do is, you let the nature to decide what to come up or what to what to be there in that site. So what you do is you just try to promote the natural seedlings that are coming up and remove the competitive species which will disturb uh, the growth of those natural seedlings. Uh, this is actually assisting nature to regenerate. 
So we, it is called as assisted macular regeneration or ANR in short. The best example for ANR, uh, place where ANR was practiced, is the uh, IFS copper marbletum, where I work. And um, as you can, um, some of you may have visited that place. That was bought by, uh, that's a small land bought by um, a gentleman called Sam Popham back in 1963. And then uh, he led the, the natural seedlings to come up. And then after about 20 years, he was able to get a, a very good dry evergreen for us. And currently there are about 369 uh, plant species, 25 species of mammals, 83 species of birds, and 77 butterfly species, and God knows how many other microorganisms. So there are so many different types of organisms coming up with the, with the, the, the emergence of the forest. These are some photographs, photographs taken in 1962 and 63, and then this is how it looks in 2018, uh, 1990, and 2018. And uh, if you go there, you see a flock of bio, uh, this jungle fowl, and for, also if you go there at night, you see lorries, slender lorries, and uh, pangolin, and those, so many, even deer, so many um, large mammals as well. So, uh, so that's about uh, conserving or uh, restoring the forest. Now, a uh, lot of people think uh, that forest is the type and we should give our priority forest. And uh, you have seen so many different ecosystems in this country. It's a very small country, but so many different types of ecosystems. Ecosystem diversity is something which we don't talk about much. Kavi Sindhu Liuna Madi ecosystem diversity. And so we have to pay our attention not only to the forest and to other ecosystems as well. Now I want to show a wet patana grassland. Some of you may have visited. This is Horton Tail. It's a beautiful site with a lot of biodiversity, biodiversity with some point in the mix. And uh, although you see grasses, there are so many different types of herbs that are growing among grass, and some of those are point in the mix, which are found only in Horton Tail. Small, uh, uh, you know, uh, dicot species. And then uh, uh, in uh, in the late uh, 60s and early 70s. About 1,000 acres of this uh, grassland, wet patana grassland, was cultivated with potato by the Department of Agriculture. It's a government, by the way. And then uh, it was abandoned due to the pressure from the environmentalist, one of the first battles won by environmentalists. And then now, uh, this is how it looked uh, after uh, abandoning the, the, the potato. It, it became a kind of a carpet like uh, grassland, not like the tough of grasses you know, you see here. And then uh, now, gradually, uh, this uh, uh, carpet type uh, grassland, uh, you know, this modified grassland because of the, uh, the abandoning of this potato land is now turning into uh, tussle grassland like this. Since there's this is time, I, I, I'm not going to go into de the details of this because there's very interesting things here. And then uh, if you go to Horton Plains, you see so many other different types of vegetation dynamics here. This is uh, rhododendron invading uh, the grassland, uh, this bamboo invading the grassland. This is Corona densifolia. By the way, this, is this genus was described by you know some scientists in Columbia University, Professor uh, Dr. Hashendra um, Kathiraj and her team. It was early Arundin area, Sindhan area, and uh, they came up with this new genus Corona after the Sinhala name Corona. This is a, a bamboo type uh, plant, it's actually bamboo, but which uh, I don't know the details. But this is also enc encroaching, as you can see. This is all this Corona. Uh, originally, it was found in the marsh areas. Now it's found, uh, now it's uh, encroaching the upland area. So this is not marsh. This, this is not a marsh area. This up, upland uh, grass. So this, this grass is invading, this bamboo is invading uh, the, the, that area. Also. Why? Because there was an ecologically important factor operating, and that was fire. So fire was removed, and because of that uh, removal of fire, this uh, grass is improve, uh, encroaching, uh, this ba bamboo is encroaching, and then also uh, the, the, uh, uh, the other things were also happening um, uh, because of this, uh, the, 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 that other uh, invasive plant. It's also uh, encroaching uh, the Ulex Europeus, uh, expanding because fire was actually keeping it at bay, but then now there are so many things happening because of this lack of fire. Now, if you go to a, a savanna vegetation, it's a very important uh, ecosystem altogether, uh, unique ecosystem in Bibila and various other areas. The lush vegetation here, uh, savanna is a, it's a vegetation with grasses and 
some interesting trees like Arlo Bulunelli and all that, Kamalu. And then these also maintain because of fire, like that uh, regularly you get fire. And then if you, after fire, you see something like that. And they, when, when uh, after some time, the natural, uh, the grass, grasses will come and uh, the uh, ecosystem will be like that again. Like, there was a time uh, when uh, there was a project uh, operated by, uh, funded by the World Bank on, uh, on medicinal plants and uh, there are a lot of activities happened. And one of the things that was done uh, during that project was trying to improve or, uh, uh, you know, restore these savannas by planting other trees in between. They thought that this is a degraded ecosystem with scattered trees. Why not uh, improve this ecosystem by planting trees? So they just planted kumbuk and kohomba and all sorts of nonsense in between these trees. And so luckily it was not successful. Anyway, so what I'm going to uh, propose is that uh, uh, it's all right to talk about it and have seminars and meetings and so forth, but then someone has to get back to, get to business and do something. So what I propose is that we have to select sensitive disturbed ecosystems first and then develop restoration plans using most appropriate methods. So in some areas you may have to do direct planting. There's no other option. If it is just a barren land, you can't wait until natural seedlings come. Or sometimes you can uh, apply uh, the framework species method or, 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 or ANR. So depending on the site, you can select the appropriate, most appropriate uh, restoration method. And then you should have a time bound action plan and when you should do what. And uh, also you have to assign responsibility, who will do what and when. And then you know, of course you have to expedite the matter, expedite the restoration activities. And then most importantly, you have to monitor the progress because uh, unless you monitor the progress, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. There are so many projects happen and uh, reports have been written and all these are in different you know, places in different shells and after about 10-15 years another group will come and they, they, they don't know what was there before and then they start doing the same thing again and reinvent the, reinvent the wheel. So this is what, is what was happening in this country. So I think um, I can see that a lot of younger people are participating in this. So you have to somehow persuade people and hire authorities or whoever who can take a decision and then do something and then see whether our valuable ecosystems are restored and it's not just the forest there are so many other different ecosystems and then you, unless you pay attention to those ecosystems we will lose our ecosystem diversity thank you thank you very much for the insightful and informative talk professor now, I would like to warmly welcome an innovative young lady and an exemplary environmental activist, Ms. Udari Mohotte, to talk about smart actions and choices towards minimizing threats to our ecosystems. She's an, she's an interior designer, a product designer, and was a youth ambassador for United Nations My Future, My Voice campaign for Earth Day 2020. She has graduated from the University of Moratua in product designing and holds a BIT degree from the University of Colombo. She is the founder of Omo Designs, which is an eco-friendly brand of jewelry and gift items. Ms. Udari, over to you. Uh, good, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sandini and uh, Professor Lokupitiya for inviting me for this session and giving me this opportunity to address all of these uh, uh, people who have uh, who have joined today so um, it was a very insightful session that we had and um, I actually have uh, like I have I even I learned a lot of things during this session so I'll be talking about um, quite a different approach uh, towards this um, topic and uh, my topic that I'll be addressing today is uh, smart actions and choices towards minimizing threats to our ecosystem uh, as a designer's approach so I will be uh, taking examples from my personal uh, project uh, Trash to Treasure. So, and uh, I will uh, explain uh, as um, Sandani and uh, Professor Lokopitiya introduced before that it's mainly uh, about uh, where I address the problem of waste. 
So uh, I'll just once again brief uh, about myself. I'm Udari Mohoti. Uh, I'm a designer uh, by profession, and uh, I'm also the founder and director of my uh, personal company, Omo Designs. I'm also working as a professional, as an interior designer at a reputed company, and I was uh, I am a global youth ambassador uh, at the United Nations. Uh, my future, my voice campaign. And I'm also a graduate of the University of Moratua, a Bachelor in Designs Honours degree. So uh, I'll just start my topic by the topic that we have been uh, discussing uh, from the beginning of this session. So I'll just go br briefly uh, as, uh, through this to uh, relate to my uh, subject here. So uh, as we all know, uh, ecosystems are um, a community of living and non-living organisms in a given area and the interactions that uh, happen among them. So ecosystems are what provide us a stable climate, the breathable air, um, the supplies of water, food and materials, and also it has a huge impact on our physical and mental health too. So uh, as uh, um, uh, so as uh, we discussed all this time, so the United Nations has this, uh, like declared a few uh, types of ecosystems, and I won't be going in detail on those, but um, I'll uh, move straight for like straight into my topic here. So um, I'll be talking about the threats uh, that we have to our ecosystem and how uh, we can. Uh, we can reduce or how we can take action against this. So um, the human footprint on uh, these ecosystems is one of the main reasons that we have had to address this issue today. So when we talk about the uh, human footprint, it is uh, mainly about the human exploitations of nature due to the rising population and also our hunger for land and resources. So because due to these reasons, uh, humans have uh, started uh, taking away the natural habitats of uh, a variety of biological species. It can, it is uh, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, but due to uh, all these uh, reasons, we are facing a huge crisis. Uh, uh, with global warming and all these issues. So um, I'll be addressing on few uh, major uh, parts as in the pollution, the pollution and uh, the waste products that we uh, dispose uh, quite frequently out uh, to the environment. So when we uh, uh, take the um, the human footprint, the waste, uh, waste uh, like re when it relates to waste, there are uh, many uh, in, like, many negative impacts on uh, the environment that uh, is that the the in, the impact made by trash that we uh, that we throw out every day. So the three main categories I would say would be the climate change, the effect on wildlife, and on public health. So though we don't uh, realize it the amount of uh, waste that we throw out can impact on um, like for example the landfills that we uh, the landfills the emitting of uh, gases the when we burn the the emission the emitting levels of uh, carbon dioxide all these uh, issues will affect uh, the climate change and at the same time, uh, we are taking away the livelihoods of uh, a variety of species, biological species, and also with the uh, ingestion of uh, these material that we throw away, we are uh, creating a huge uh, life risk uh, for these um, uh, wildlife species. So uh, at the same time, uh, we talk about the public health sector. So the amount of uh, trash that we are throwing out and the negative impact of these are affecting uh, the public health sector in a huge uh, way uh, with uh, breathing difficulties, birth defects, cancers, even childhood cancers and so many other uh, health impacts uh, due to this uh, one uh, factor that is the trash. So um, it is a common uh, thing, it's a common topic that we uh, have discussed, but at the same time, we don't realize um, how much of an impact we make. And also we don't uh, realize what sort of solution we can give uh, towards this problem also. 
So um, as uh, it was discussed in the beginning uh, by uh, Professor Lokopiti also, uh, the UN has uh, declared a decade, a, a decade of uh, the ecosystem restoration that uh, started, that initiated on the 5th of June. Uh, and uh, it is uh, basically a 10 year push to halt and reverse the decline of the natural world, a joint effort of the community as a whole to make an impact. So this, uh, if this uh, this um, if it has been initiated so that uh, everyone around the world will join hands together and uh, contribute in whatever possible way towards uh, making a change. So here um, I would be on the ecosystem by changing what you do, how you act, and what you buy. So uh, when we talk about ecosystem restoration. Um, there are three main things that we can uh, do. So in like, if we think about how we can contribute towards this ecosystem restoration, there are three main uh, things that we can do. One, we can, uh, we can choose to act. The other thing is we can uh, make choices, like lifestyle choices. And uh, the third thing would be uh, we can raise our voice. So by all three of these ways, we can uh, create, we can make our own voices count and uh, we can uh, make a positive impact on um, this ecosystem restoration. And uh, I will be talking about reversing the footprint. So as I said, I'll be focusing mainly on the uh, concept of waste. So there are so many things. There are natural wastes, there are man-made wastes, there are certain things that we uh, can avoid using and throwing away. There are certain things that we can't avoid also. So um, what my, uh, my approach towards this problem is, uh, rather than always considering these uh, waste products as trash, I, uh, as a designer, my approach has been to see if we can convert these uh, trash items into something that a person can treasure. So, as in, it is like, uh, it's a, uh, I want to give a solution uh, to this trash problem without, uh, with the minimum uh, impact to on the environment once again, and see if these items as it is, we can convert into something that can be treasured by another person. So if we we generally have um, a prejudice against these items, like when you see these trash items in these photographs, it is in general, we, we wouldn't even think about touching those things. But um, if we uh, try to see a positive side of it, if we try to see something that we can reuse out of it, uh, there are so many uh, things we can uh, make use of these items once again. So that is what I have uh, been, that is my approach towards uh, say, like helping uh, this uh, ecosystem. And uh, that is the approach I have taken uh, towards uh, my products and my uh, work uh, as an individual. So uh, I'll uh, take you uh, through what I have done and uh, what I uh, like, how I have thought of, uh, like how I have converted these trash items into something uh, treasurable and uh, how uh, much potential that we, everyone uh, watching can take, like how much uh, potential ideas you can take out of uh, these small things that can be converted into something more. So uh, as a designer, I see design as uh, a point where uh, responsibility meets aesthetics. So if you look at these uh, images uh, that I have displayed on the background, those are all uh, items I have created out of these materials that you saw before. So the same waste items that I showed in the previous slide, this uh, image uh, displays a few items that I have converted them into um, a designer product. So I'll start about uh, with one of my first uh, projects, um, which is uh, my one of the first projects in my trash to treasure uh, project. So it is jewelry that was handcrafted out of vehicle tires and tubes. So if we take uh, if we take uh, if we go through the studies, they say that uh, 550 million scrap tires are dumped every year. So there's a, uh, if this 550 million tires are piled up one upon each other, 
uh, it is one third of the distance from the Earth to the Moon. So we don't realize the amount of um, this sort of waste is not something we realize that we are throwing out, but it's not something we can uh, control much also. So the reason this um, is becoming a huge impact on uh, the environment, it's becoming a huge impact uh, towards um, uh, like a negative impact on creating a negative impact is because of its linear life cycle. So if you look at these uh, right side, the images I have displayed, all these have been handcrafted. There's not any machinery involvement. It's completely handcrafted out of waste vehicle tires and tubes. So it is fully handmade. It is uh, no chemical involvement, no uh, machinery involvement. It's fully handcrafted, a set of hand uh, jewelry. But like I said, if we immediately think of a waste tire, that impression and what we uh, once it's converted into a uh, product like this the idea beyond that so that is mainly the I, that is mainly the uh, drive behind my work so um, this is one project that i have uh, done so i won't be i won't be touching on everything i'll just go through few uh, due to the limited time but uh, this is one project that i have done the second one would be uh these packaging items so uh, like i said there are natural waste also so after harvesting uh, we don't there's a huge uh, quantity of banana stems that uh, will become waste material so it will be getting collected it will be blocking waterways it sometimes it contributes to these mosquito problems and so many other issues because uh, the annual wastage of uh, one banana of banana stems like an annual uh, wastage is uh, around uh, 30 million rupees. So, uh, but one thing we don't realize is even these waste items that are just naturally thrown out, it has no, um, like it's just waste. It has no value at that point, but it, it has certain uh, uh, qualities, certain unique qualities that can be uh, converted into so many other things. There are uh, other products also made out of banana fiber in uh, the market. Uh, here, what I have uh, displayed is one uh, set of uh, uh, packaging material that I have created. That is uh, because this banana stem and this banana fiber, once it's uh, uh, once it's uh, taken into this state, it uh, has uh, qualities. One is the flexibility of it. The other is it can absor absorb uh, a lot of uh, the order. So here what I have uh, used is as a packaging material for tea. So where the smell, the aroma of uh, tea can be absorbed in this material. And also it will be, um, uh, this was a project that I uh, uh, did uh, with the uh, uh, reputed uh, tea company. So for the export market of tea. So again, uh, items that are, uh, that uh, affect the uh, environment as waste, where it can be converted into something that can be given a larger value. The another thing is uh, this set of products that I do. So one, uh, these are a, a collection of uh, customized portraits and jewelry items that I create out of waste packaging material. So if you look at this left side, these are all the, we don't realize the, um, how colorful our trash can can be at one point. So once we throw out all the packaging material, the boxes, the, um, the, all these wrappers, uh, it contains a lot of colors, a lot of different textures, which we can utilize without again any chemical involvement or any machinery involvement. So these items that you see on the left side are exactly what have been used to convert the, uh, to these products. So again, completely handcrafted, completely handmade. But uh, again, what we have thrown out, what we usually consider as trash has been converted into these items. So uh, that is like even these jewelry items, it's all handcrafted out of these uh, waste uh, products that we have thrown, like waste paper, waste packaging materials that we throw out only has been converted to all these items. So this is another project that I have uh, done uh, uh, under uh, my concept uh, trash to treasure. 
So uh, in addition to these, there, these are a few more uh, biodegradable uh, packaging and souvenir collections that I have done, a uh, few miscellaneous uh, products that I have done. So the uh, idea I want to give is there is no such thing as throwing away items. So whatever we throw, it will end up somewhere. So it is up to us to decide where we will, uh, where this trash is going to end up. So um, that is where my collection comes. Uh, these are a few of the products that I just explained before. So all handcrafted material without any machinery or chemical involvement, once again, uh, are completely made out of waste material or biodegradable items. Uh, as a designer, this would be my approach. So um, last, I would like to conclude my uh, topic here is uh, with the uh, great uh, the quote that uh, the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that somebody else will save it. it every person uh, who has joined here today has the power and uh, to make a change in this world. If you want to do it, whatever it is, you can convert your passion into something responsible, responsible for you, for your future generations and for this planet. So I would like to conclude um, my uh, session, uh, thank you very much uh, for involving me. Um, so my uh, message is that there is nothing that uh, that there is nothing that is impossible. If we believe that we can do it, everything is impossible only as long as we believe it can't be done. So thank you very much. Um, I'll be uh, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing and promoting this valuable eco-friendly concept, Ms. Udari. Now, it's time to move on to the last session of the program. The next guest speaker is Ms. Michelle Dilhara. She is an award-winning, promising actress in Sri Lankan cinema and television. She is an author who has received the National Youth Icon Award in 2019 at the World Youth Summit for her book, Social Invisibility is Not a Fiction, It Exists. And in 2020, for her theory, Theory of Alternative Social Cockwheel. Currently, she is working as the Earth Day Network Ambassador of Sri Lanka. And today, she will be talking on urban restoration and reviving the solution to heal the world's climate crisis and global warming. Ms. Michelle, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so good evening to all of you. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Andati and uh, Sandani. For inviting me for this session. This is organized by Columbia University in commemoration with the Earth Day and the World Environment Day. So, as you probably know, this year's theme for Environment Day is ecosystem restoration. Uh, so, today I'll be uh, focusing on urban ecosystem restoration and rewilding. So, you might ask me why is urban ecosystem restoration and rewilding important at this point? It's because of climate change which has pushed our weather system into extremes with long hot spells with droughts like we have experienced four years ago and also rainy spells with thunder showers and lightning in an unpredictable manner as we are experiencing now. So let's take Colombo as an example. When the weather is warm and sunny during the non-rainy season, we can't live in an apartment in Colombo without an AC or we can't ride a vehicle uh, without turning on the AC or we can't uh, walk on streets in the afternoon. Why? Because it's too hot during uh, sunny season. That extreme weather factor due to the climate change makes the heat more hotter than the previous years. So this aspect of climate change is now described as global warming. So uh, uh, as Professor Randati and all the other uh, honored speakers uh, mentioned about some of the uh, basic um, some of the main points of, of what is global warming and what is climate change. I would also like to give you uh, uh, points on uh, how we have damaged our climate, how we have damaged our ecosystems. So yeah, let's move forward. Uh, so today, according to the World Bank statistics and UN reports, urban areas generate more than 80% of the gross domestic products. They also provide home to more than 55% of the world's population. Approximately 4.2 billion inhabitants 
live-in cities and is expected to increase to 68 percent by 2050. So by 2050, <clears throat> with the increasing urban population, nearly seven out of 10 people in the world will live in cities and they will consume more than 78 percent of the world's energy and emit 70 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. So cities um, play a um, major role in like tackling climate change because uh, their exposure to climate and disaster risk increases as they grow, as the population grows. So almost half a billion urban residents live in coastal areas. And uh, uh, this, this increase in population, due to this increase in population, the vulnerability uh, to storm surges and sea levels are rising. So there are 100 million people uh, in 136 biggest coastal cities. So 20% of their population and their 4.7 uh, uh, trillion dollar worth assets are exposed to coastal floods. So around 90% of the uh, urban expansion in developing countries are near hazard prone areas, which are built through informal and unplanned settlements. So it is very important to focus on uh, urban ecosystem restoration uh, because cities are the major contributors to climate change. And that is what we have been talking uh, for the past few hours and what the other honorable speakers have been uh, uh, explaining through their speech. So according to the UN Habitat, cities consume 78% of the world's energy and uh, produce more than 60% of the greenhouse gas emissions, as I mentioned earlier. But still, that is less than 2% of the Earth's surface. How much do you think Earth's uh, climate is changing right now? It's changing unpredictably at an exponential rate, and uh, at an unpredictable rate. The global warming factor is the most worrisome, it's the more, that, that is the most devastating threat uh, that the whole world is facing right now. Some parts of the earth is warming faster than the others. On average, the global atmospheric temperature has increased nearly 1.5 degrees Celsius in the past 100 years, which means we are reaching the point of no return because we are supposed to uh, keep the global atmospheric temperature to below 2 degrees Celsius, according to the Paris Agreement. So according to a report released by NASA in 2021, as Professor Anduti also mentioned, during the past 140 years, 2015 to 2020 have been recorded as the warmest years. So as the climate continues to warm, the intensity and uh, the amount of rainfall during storms are expected to increase, as well as droughts and, hot, uh, and heat waves are also expected to become more intense. So since the Industrial Revolution in 1760 that took place in 1760, humans have emitted more than 2,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which means that the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide has been increased by 48% over the 171 years, over the past 171 years. This is more than what And the U.S. Energy Information Administration has estimated that in 2019, the global emissions of energy-related carbon dioxide were 33.1 billion metric tons. And in May 2020, according to the NASA, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere was recorded as, as 417.1 parts per million. So parts per million is the measurement used uh, to measure the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it's said, and it's then it is said that the, atm the car atm car atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, percent, uh, the uh, the uh, concentration of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere should be below 300 parts per million in order to maintain a healthy ecosystem. So, due to this increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the planet has started to trap more and more sun's heat from the uh, Earth's atmosphere. So today, 90% of the Earth's atmosphere, 90% uh, of the heat in the atmosphere is absorbed by the ocean 
resulting thermal expansion and it affects the marine uh, life as well as melting of ice. So ocean is said to be one of the natural carbon sinks we have, but gradually our activities are destroying this natural carbon sink as well. So due to this uh, melting, of, melting of ice, the sea level has also started to rise at an alarming rate. So according to a report released by the NASA, the average global sea level has rise to 8.9 inches between 1880 and 2015, which is much faster than in the previous 2,700 years. It usually takes 2,700 years for this much of a uh, uh, sea level rise to happen. But in the past, uh, within the past 140 years, the sea level has uh, rise to 8.9 inches. <clears throat> so as I described earlier, climate change has caused weather patterns to be less unpredictable. And these unpredictable weather patterns have caused issues like diseased harvest, of increased floods, droughts, extreme weather events, desertification, and displacement of hundreds of millions of people. So this aspect of desertification and displacement of hundreds of million people have also triggered the economy as well. So how much do you think, economic, economically speaking, the impact of uh, the impact from climate change is costing us? So according to an article that was released in the Economist magazine, approximately $100 billion worth of damages have caused due to the climate change and extreme events. And they have also stated that if we uh, uh, do not control this situation, within the next 30 years, the damages from climate change and extreme weather events can reach to $8 trillion. So is there a magic solution? Like what can we do to mitigate these impacts? How can we adapt this uh, into this new reality? So we need to think, we need to think about how the electricity, how our electricity is generated and what fuel choices we make. So we should install renewable energy resources like solar energy, wind energy, hydro energy, thermal energy, and uh, renewable energy sources like this uh, as much as we can. So uh, uh, we, we also have to have this 100%, uh, we have to have the goal that we will, uh, uh, our target should be 100% renewable energy goals. Yeah, as I mentioned, um, uh, so we should try to install uh, renewable so energy sources as much as we can. And also we should encourage the other institutions and uh, other uh, people who are responsible for these uh, constructions. We should encourage them to try to build these renewable energy sources as much as we can. So not only these, not only uh, installing renewable energy sources, there's another problem that is causing climate change in these urban areas. So that is our urban, our urban lifestyle is further aggravating the uh, global warming issues and also the resource depletion issues and the hidden health impact issues from pollution. So industrial agriculture that supports urban consumption has become a major contributor to pollution. It has led our soils to be destroyed with intensive use of fertilizers and pesticides. This is also another major problem that is taking place right now in the agriculture field. That itself has led to an increase in non-communicable diseases as all our drinking water rivers are polluted with chemical toxins, and sadly, our water board can only clean out the organic pollutants and not the chemical pollutants. So we drink it and use that contaminated water with heavy metals for our cooking as well. So therefore, if the soil biodiversity keeps declining, so with this uh, uh, large amount of fertilizer usage, our soil biodiversity also keeps declining. So if the soil biodiversity keeps declining, there will be a huge loss of water and food production to meet the needs of the growing population. So currently 40% of the world's land mass is dry and these rising temperatures will turn yet more of it into desert. And at current rates, 
The amount of food we are growing today will only feed half of the population by 2050. And also 20%, 28% of the agriculture lies in water stressed regions. And it takes roughly 1,821 liters of water to produce a kilogram of wheat. And the number of people facing water shortages would double by 2050. So all of what I have described to you uh, for the past, hour, uh, past few minutes uh, should make us realize how unsustainable our lifestyle is. So let's see uh, if there is anything more we can do beyond adjusting our lifestyle. Basically, uh, uh, I think uh, the, the, all our honorable speakers have uh, spoken about the ecosystem, have given a small, uh, have given an overview about the ecosystem. So basically the ecosystem we live is self-dependent, just like a bubble of life. We are plants, animals, and we are the organisms as well as weather and landscape, they all work together to form a cycle. So every factor in our ecosystem depends on every other factor, either directly or indirectly. For instance, when changes occur in one factor, natural systems shift, species are substituted for each other and the food chains reorganize. So this is where ecosystem restoration gets the spotlight. So ecosystem restoration is designing or restoring ecosystem according to the ecological principle learned over the past century. That has a value on both human and nature. So that's very important. It should have the value to both human and nature. So for the past uh, 10 years, uh, the world has been trying to implement more, uh, ecosystem restoration, but a, percent, a percentage of those projects have been backfired due to practical and several financial issues. So uh, when you're talking about ecosystem restoration, uh, as Professor Cyril said, there are uh, so many areas to be covered, such as farmland, forests, oceans and coasts, urban areas, freshwater, etc., etc., etc. It goes on and gone. But today, we need to focus, and I'll be focusing on uh, urban ecological restoration and rewilding. Why? Because we are living in a in the century of urbanization. We are living in cities. So cities actually form a large global network connected by flows of energy, food, and information. So this global network is the challenge of the 21st century. How do we make more sustainable cities with small ecological footprints? So to meet that percentage of growth, to meet the percentage of growth of the population, we will have to double our infrastructure. So ecosystem, uh, urban ecosystem restoration is about building the infrastructure in cities to meet the needs of the growing population. Because uh, take, for example, the economic and the impacts of health effects, health, uh, the human activities, such as floods, hurricanes, and uh, human deaths due to air pollution. If we uh, connect this with COVID-19, now when the COVID-19 pandemic emerged, all the countries were under lockdown, airports were closed, necessary measures were taken to control it. But statistically, if you say statistically, the death, the death rate due to air pollution in a year is approximately twice higher than the total deaths due to the pandemic. That's a serious problem. We are living in a time where an estimated 7 million people worldwide die every year due to air pollution. And that's approximately 10% of the world population, which is 7.9 billion. So this is 2021. Can you estimate the death rate by 2050? So how are we, how are we to avoid this threat? How, what solutions can we uh, implement to avoid this threat? Maybe individually or even group-wise or university-wise or institution-wise or, uh, you know, uh, even uh, by joining all the youth, how can we do it? There are a few techniques we can follow. So I would like to uh, explain, I would like to talk about three techniques that we are personally, like I'm personally implementing uh, with most of the youth. So one technique is the urban forestry. So this can be used for urban restoration, for urban ecosystem restoration and to boost the urban biodiversity. 
uh, I think Professor C Cyril uh, uh, also mentioned about uh, uh, reforestation. So just like that, this is something that we can do in the urban in, in cities, in the urban system, uh, cities. So urban forests are actually miniature forests, mini forests that can get that can be created on patches of land in the urban areas. So the idea is actually simple. All you have to take is, all you have to do is, you can take brown field sites, uh, lands that are not being used, plant them with a wide variety of native seedlings. That's very important. So we have to uh, plant it with native seedlings and let them grow with a minimal uh, minimum intervention. So, and you have to make sure that the plants we use have to be native and it has to be native to that particular region and it's climate. So these urban forests, these urban forests will help to mitigate the heat extremes, provide urban cooling, block away excess carbon and keep the climate stable. It will also help to boost the urban biodiversity by attracting native species like butterflies, birds and bees. So it has uh, two benefits. Not, not actually two, it has so many benefits. Uh, urban forestry is one tech, uh, technology. So rewilding is another solution. Actually, rewilding can be done through urban forestry also. So rewilding is, uh, this rewilding refers to a range of processes through which humans ensure that non-human species and natural processes are reintroduced into the landscape in a way that they can be self-sustaining once more. So actually this uh, rewilding, uh, was developed as a method to preserve functional ecosystems and to reduce the uh, biodiversity loss. So as I mentioned earlier, we can achieve rewilding through urban forestry. So if we can implement the concept of urban forestry in cities, in schools, universities, and even in homes, I think we will be able to create a sustainable environment rich in biodiversity for the future generations. So just like uh, urban forestry, City tree uh, installations. I don't know if you all have heard the, the city tree installations. This can also be used to reduce the air pollution and to achieve carbon neutrality. So since the carbon dioxide percentage has re reached in the atmosphere, we could use this uh, city tree installation to reduce it. So city tree is actually not uh, an actual tree because actual trees take time to grow, but the city tree is not like an actual tree. It's like actually a moss culture. So the moss, moss is used in uh, to build the city tree. The, uh, you can also search this on Google, city tree. So this moss protected by plant coverage binds particulate matter, nitrogen, nitrogen oxides and carbon dioxide. So it, it attracts all these uh, excess carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides and all the particulate matter and produces oxygen. So at the same time, also cools the surrounding air. So just to give a small uh, idea about this invention, about this innovation, so each installation, uh, as some countries, they have started this process, have started this initiative, then in each installation, means uh, uh, the, each of these installations is about three meters wide, and it stands almost four meters tall, and these were planted about two, three meters deep. So the best part about the city tree is that uh, it's capable of providing the same environmental benefit we could get from 275 actual trees. And it's able to absorb uh, approximately 250 grams of particles per day, removing 240 metric tons of carbon dioxide every year because most cultures, most cultures have a much larger uh, leaf surface area than any other plant. So that means we can capture more pollutants. And it also takes only a small space to install. So, so uh, if we can try to, you know, if we can uh, try to install this in the cities, uh, I think we could reduce this uh, air pollution in some extent. So uh, it's another technology we can try to introduce. And especially as university students, as university students, we have the opportunity to design many innovations and new technologies to the world. So I suggest, I suggest you 
to consider nature as a key factor when introducing these inventions in technology. And also spread the word and create awareness on these issues and solutions with other youth and children as much as you can so that it could motivate them to do the same as well. So uh, that is uh, something you can do from your side. So with that, uh, we have another concept of city farming technology. So uh, city farming technology is also a good technology we can, uh, a concept we can actually try it individually because, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are under lockdown, currently under lockdown. So the idea of that is also simple. It's just using, you know, small unused lands, maybe in your school cities, or as I mentioned, in homes, in your gardens or rooftops. We are turning them into mini farms. So since, our, since the soil we use right now is poor soil because all the contaminations that has happened due to these various pollution, our soil has become uh, poor. But with food waste, we waste a lot of food every day. But instead of throwing them and burning them, we can uh, you know, uh, turn this food waste into compost and use this food waste compost for these mini farms. You can you know, uh, use this, uh, dump this food waste like two feet deep in your farming area. So this will actually give us rich soil. As we all know, rich soil provides healthy food. Uh, and, also, and, and also it's twice larger than the food production in poor soil. So one thing is this system helps us to use food waste sustainably, produce healthy food for our families as well as provide financial benefits as well. How? Because we all know it's very hard for us to find fresh food, fruits and vegetables in supermarkets. Uh, uh, so through this, we can uh, save the fossil fuel uh, burns and also we can make a lot of use of this. So these are some of the uh, technologies that we can use to use in urban areas, especially, and some of the implementations that we are also doing. So it's up to us actually to decide whether we leave a healthy or unhealthy ecosystem for our next generation, because what we have to think is there are approximately 7.8 billion people in the world. And according to the UN, roughly 255 babies are born in a minute, 350,000 are born each day, and that's more than 130 million a year. Imagine that. So I hope you would spread the word and start and launch programs to mitigate these environmental issues before the next World Environment Day. So thank you once again. Thank you so much, Professor Rambati and uh, Sandini for inviting me uh, for this session. Thank you so much for all the speakers and all the participants as well. Have a good day. Thank you very much, Ms. Michelle. Your commitment to conserving nature is truly inspirational. I hope this program was indeed a very successful one and have been a great platform to share knowledge and experiences. Now it's time to wind up today's webinar. On behalf of the Center for Environmental Initiatives, I would like to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to the guest speakers, Professor Cyril Vijay Sundar, Ms. Kudari Mohotti, and Ms. Michelle Dilhara for accepting our invitation and sparing time from their busy schedules to grace this occasion. I'm sure all who are present here will have a lot to take away from their speeches. Thank you very much for your participation. We would like to thank Senior Professor Chandrika Vijayaratna, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Colombo, for all her support throughout our journey. And a big thank you to all the staff and students who accepted our invitation. We greatly appreciate your presence here today. We would also like to thank Professor Heva Gamage, Director UCSC, Learn Team, Mr. Layan, Mr. Tisaru, and Ms. Harshi at NOC, and Mr. Luanga Amarasekar from FOS Media for all the support extended. I'm grateful to Professor Randhati Rakupitiya, the Director of the Center for Environmental Initiatives, for all her support and guidance to make this event successful. Once again, thank you all for your attention. Have a wonderful evening. Stay safe.